It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Latter-day Saints are a question-asking people. So said Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf during a church education system fireside a decade ago. Listen. What about doubts and questions in principle? Is it all right to have questions about the church or its doctrine? My dear young friends, we are a question-asking people. We have always been. Because we know that inquiry leads to truth. That is the way how the church got its start, from a young man who had questions. In fact, I'm not sure how one can discover truth without asking questions. Inquiry is the birthplace of testimony. Some might feel embarrassed or unworthy because they have searching questions regarding the gospel, but they needn't feel that way. Asking question isn't a sign of weakness. It's a precursor of growth. God commands us to seek answers to our questions and ask only that we seek with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ. When we do so, the truth of all things can be manifest to us by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Maxwell Institute's Executive Director, Spencer Fluman recently addressed this pressing topic during Brigham Young University's 2019 Women's Conference. In this episode, we're pleased to bring you his address, answering sincere questions about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you'd like a transcript of these remarks, sign up for the Maxwell Institute monthly newsletter. We'll include the transcript in our next issue. You can sign up at bit.ly slash Maxwell News. By the way, stick around because at the end of the devotional remarks, Spencer Fluman will join me to talk about a new book series that the Maxwell Institute's producing about the Book of Mormon. And now Spencer Fluman presents Answering Sincere Questions About the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Sisters, it's good to be with you. We are here to wrestle together today with a task that likely will fall to each of us at some point in our lives to answer difficult gospel questions. You noticed perhaps that the word sincere was included in this session title. I'll be addressing sincere questions today. Liz is offered to answer sarcastic or snarky ones. <laughs> Just kidding. We are both here talking about answering those questions of a sincere variety, presumably the difficult ones that come from a place of searching or pain or doubt or crisis or loss, the ones that sometimes stop us in our tracks. I've been answering gospel questions for a very long time. In over 20 years of BYU teaching in religion and history, I've answered more than a few. As a church leader and as a parent, I've answered a few more. Even with all that experience though, I am fully intimidated by this topic. I have actually grown more cautious and felt more pressure as I've matured. <laughs> you see the gray hair, sisters. It tells the tale. Uh, Gwen cuts my hair here at BYU. She calls them platinum blonde highlights. <laughs> sisters, these are the ones you don't have to pay for. Am I right? The truth is, I have been mightily humbled over the years. Where I used to charge in, I now pause a bit. I want to talk about those pauses today. If you've received that gospel doctrine calling to teach and thought, finally, now I can impart my vast knowledge to these good people, <laughs> you are not going to like this talk. <laughs> if, on the other hand, you are terrified at the thought of answering difficult questions, the next 19 minutes are for you. If you feel like a fraud just about every time you try to teach anything about the gospel, this one's for you. So let's start with that terror at the thought of representing the gospel or the church or its leaders. I felt it keenly as a full-time missionary more than a quarter century ago. And back then I believed a myth about answering difficult questions that held me back for some time. Here's the myth. 
If I could just find the right words, if I could just find the perfect scripture, if I could just bear that flawless testimony. Sisters, that mythic search for the perfect antidote to skepticism or criticism or despair kept me on a fool's quest for months. The truth is, there is no perfect response. There is no perfect formula. Notice, too, a problem at the root of my missionary myth. If I could, if I, 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 I. Preparation is important. And focused gospel study should be a lifelong passion for every one of us. But my concerns back then were unquestionably centered primarily on myself. Well-intentioned or not, it was about me. I propose today that we reorient our topic away from ourselves just a bit. We might think together this afternoon about answers that are questioner-focused. I'm interested, sisters, in other words, in making our exchanges with those questioners less defensive, less pressure-packed, less consumed with our needs and our responsibilities, and more about them. I suspect this will change just about everything. For instance, where we might have charged in with answers or a testimony before, if we're questioner-focused, we might hold back just a little. That is, before responding, I may want to know a little bit more about the question or about the questioner. What sits behind the question? Does it come from a place of curiosity or does it come from a place of pain? Does it come as testimony is just coming into life? Or does that question come just as testimony seems to be withering on the vine? Can you see how important it is to focus on the questioner rather than our insecurities or responsibilities? It's natural to want to help or be heard, I'll admit. That's natural and good. Our desire to respond quickly can certainly spring from those noble places. In fact, that desire to be heard isn't just an extravagance. It's a universal need. We need not deny it or dismiss it. Your voice matters, and I hope it will be heard. So for heaven's sake, each of us is obligated covenantally to be a witness. So it falls to each of us. We're called to, at some point, bear witness. So I'm certainly not saying be silent. What I am asking is this. What ultimately do we want from that exchange with the questioner? I'm asking us to assess our motivations. If, for instance, we simply want to fulfill that responsibility to be a witness, period, then we need not care for the questioner at all. If that's the extent of our interest, then we can bear our testimony and walk away. We've done our part. Check. As an aside, too, I hope it goes without saying, though you know I'm going to say it, that using a testimony like Thor's hammer to smash a doubt or a skeptic is likely to end badly. If you've ever given in to that temptation, and I may or may not have, you've found, as I may or may not have, that it leaves you feeling more than a little hollow. Boldness is sometimes called for, yes. But the overbearance that the Book of Mormon warns against surely has something to do with our lack of love for that questioner. So let's admit in those cases that the exchange was about us. It was about meeting our needs and checking our boxes. If, on the other hand, there is a deeper motivation to be had in these exchanges, such as unfeigned love for that questioner, then our boxes need to matter less and theirs should matter more. A recent experience drove this point home for me. A young woman in my life stopped me in my tracks with an exceptionally difficult question not long ago. She struggles with feelings of hopelessness. She can hardly see the good in herself most days. 
It's a victory to get through the church doors on any given Sunday. She's always been attracted to women rather than men. She served a mission in hopes that God would take those feelings away, but that's not what happened. She loves the Lord. She can't imagine her life without the church in it. But she struggles and she wonders if she can belong at all. Her deep question came to me with tremendous force. She put it this way. The church has taught me that family is the highest ideal in time and eternity. But that is not an option for me. And because it's something I didn't choose, then came her question. What do I do with the almost suffocating loneliness? Are you ready for that question? I wasn't. What would you have said? My mind started racing for an answer, but the spirit constrained me. I sat in silence for some time and the words of a covenant came into my mind with force equal to the pain in her question. Finally, I spoke, albeit cautiously. I said, it seems to me that you are in mourning. You are mourning loss. And I am covenantally bound to mourn with you. And so that is what I am going to do. I don't have an answer right now. I'm just going to mourn with you and we're going to go from there. It wasn't even an answer, sisters. But the God of heaven, whose love for that beloved daughter I can somehow feel even now, seemed to lead me there. She and I are still talking and I am still listening. And the beginnings of answers have come to both of us, but not without tears and not without time. And we have questions still. Sisters, have you noticed the bait and switch I'm perpetrating here? You came wanting to know how to better answer gospel questions. And I'm asking all of us to listen more meaningfully instead. I'm claiming here, sisters, that if we want to have our testimonies matter, if we really want to be heard, we must have that question answer exchange take place in a deeper relationship. I'll call this relational answering. This is what the Lord directs, I think, in that transcendent verse on teaching in the Doctrine and Covenants. If you listen carefully, this verse echoes in every BYU hallway and in every BYU classroom. Quote, and as all have not faith, seek ye diligently and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. The Lord's prescription for sagging faith in this world is study, yes, but also to teach one another. Questions, especially tough ones, belong in community. They belong ideally in relationships where hearts are knit together in love. That's not always possible and it's not always easy, but it's an ideal we're striving for. With that as an ideal, a question that might at first have a scrambling for scriptures or conference talks or testimony might actually call for questions back to the questioner. Tell me what prompts your question. I'm fascinated by it. Or interesting, I've got some thoughts, but before I respond, tell me more about you and your experience. Or that's a complex question and an important one. While I'm thinking, tell me your initial thoughts. You've obviously been thinking deeply about this. What are you thinking? It takes some restraint to focus on the questioner, especially when we're panicking over a loved one, or when we're intimidated by our lack of knowledge, or when we're feeling defensive about the church or its leaders. But that restraint can be essential. Doing so slows us down enough to begin to comprehend that questioner as the beloved daughter or son of God that she or he is. They are not a problem to be solved or a box to check. 
when we hear more of their heart, more of their struggle, we're in a better position to know what to do or what to say. Ultimately, love for the questioner opens up the channels of revelation. So earlier, I already exposed that myth of the perfect answer. Let me add now, though, this. Your best answer likely won't simply consist of helpful intellectual or spiritual content. Often, it's how we offer it. And even more importantly, sometimes, how it fits into the broader story of us. That's why relational answering is so important. The questioner not only benefits from your thinking on a given topic, they benefit from the net effect of that topic's influence on you. They get to see the answers not in the abstract, but in the lived reality that is you. And that is a powerful sermon, sisters. Note, for instance, two kinds of responses to a hypothetical question about following a living prophet. In one kind of response, we offer an immediate, strong, formal testimony about our unquestioning certainty that President Russell M. Nelson is God's prophet on the earth, and he alone is authorized to exercise all priesthood keys. In some cases, that might be the perfect answer. In other cases, however, a more relational exchange focused on the questioner will be better. What if, for instance, after listening, we learn that her deepest question relates to a concern that one would essentially be giving up their agency to follow a living prophet, to live a Latter-day Saint life. She worries about the perils of blind obedience. With that knowledge in hand, our own story might have more force, especially if we've wrestled with that same question or had a similar concern. Perhaps you haven't. Many of you have, though. I certainly have. Note how President Henry B. Eyring candidly acknowledged his own struggle, and in general conference, no less, some two decades ago. Here's this quote. Quote, sometimes we will receive counsel that we can't understand or that seems not to apply to us, even after careful prayer and thought. Don't discard the counsel, but hold it close. If someone you trusted handed what appeared to be nothing more than sand with the promise that it contained gold, you might wisely hold it in your hand a while shaking it gently. Every time I have done that with counsel from a prophet, after time, the gold flakes have begun to appear and I have been grateful. Do you notice there that his description of the process of wrestling with prophetic counsel did not weaken his witness, but strengthened it? In this second scenario, as you discuss your own wrestle with prophetic authority, you end up with your own life demonstrating the blessings of faith. You exemplify why it's worth giving prophets and apostles the benefit of the doubt. You reveal that your willingness to follow a living prophet is not a negation of your agency, but an informed expression of it. Your wrestle is not weakness, sisters. It is strength. As that questioner hears of your struggle and growth, they can potentially see themselves in your response, wrestling as they are with the weighty prospect of prophetic leadership. If our question and answer exchanges aren't relational, in other words, we may not have time or space to truly hear and be heard. We may not have sufficient time to teach and to learn. If you're successful, you'll go in expecting to teach something to a questioner. And if it's a truly relational exchange, you'll come away having learned something yourself. You came eager to give, and you've both received. In the end, you and your questioner will have understood one another. You'll both be edified, and you'll rejoice together. Again, it's not always possible. But that's the scriptural ideal as I understand it. Sisters, I acknowledge that some here feel exceptionally weak in testimony or gospel knowledge. Does that describe you? Do you feel broken? Are you perpetually working on your spirituality? Are you constantly, evermore, in process? Good. God can use that. 
If you fit those descriptions, we have a word for that. Faith. With all you've been through, your doubts, your disappointments, your questions, your failures, you're still here. I can't underscore that with enough ink. You're still here. That is the definition of faith. You are the definition of faith. What if someone, knowing all you've been through and knowing all the burdens you carry today, were to ask you, why are you still here? Why are you still trying? Whatever you might say in answer to that question is your sacred gift to the world. Can you see that your life is a sacred story? Let it ring. As you do, you'll be providing answers to questions, yes, but more importantly, you'll be sharing hard-earned insights about your own spiritual process. Those insights will mean as much, probably. How have you come through that disappointment? How have you navigated those valleys of faith? How have you pressed on in the dark night of apparent divine absence? In case it hasn't come through yet, sisters, let me conclude with the bottom line of this address. The most profound answer to the most difficult gospel questions is you. You are our best chance and our best argument. Your life, in all its messiness, still shouts God is good and Jesus saves. In fact, it shouts it all the more loudly because of the messiness. It isn't the perfection of your answer, and it isn't the perfection of your life that's needed. It's simply you. Through the brokenness of your journey, your story's true author is revealed. To paraphrase what a former bishop told me as a young bishop many years ago, you are not there to solve their problems. You are there to point them to Christ. Sisters, your lives and your stories do just that, just as you are. The author and finisher of our faith surely must rejoice with a sight like this and stories like these. My prayer today is that we'll take each questioner as the beloved daughter or son of God that they are. I pray that we'll take each sincere question as a threshold of love to walk through in humility. I pray that each of you will see with an eye of faith to the gift you are to a world that desperately needs you. I pray that each of us will more fully come to know the author and finisher of all of our stories of faith. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast featuring Spencer Fluman's 2019 Women's Conference Address, answering sincere questions about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can get a transcript of these remarks. If you sign up for our monthly newsletter, we only send one out a month. You can sign up at bit.ly slash Maxwell News. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Maxwell News. And now, as promised, Spencer Fluman, Executive Director of the Maxwell Institute, joins me today because the Institute is preparing to publish a new series of books on the Book of Mormon. Spencer, thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear about this series. It's exciting to talk about. We're excited about it ourselves. This series is titled The Book of Mormon, Brief Theological Introductions. And so it's a supplement to next year's curriculum from The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we're hoping it's a hit for those who want a kind of a deeper dive into the theological aspects of the text. So last year, the Maxwell Institute published Grant Hardy's study edition, the Maxwell Institute study edition of the Book of Mormon. Do you see this series as supplementing that? Yeah, I think they all fit well together. Uh, the study edition we intended, for again, for folks, not everyone wants that kind of deeper dive, but some folks do. And, and we want to bring scholarly tools and angles to folks who want that more scholarly approach to the text. And so the, the study edition was aimed to uh, support that kind of study. 
And this book series will do a similar kind of work. I think they'll work really well together for readers. And when we talk about the scholarly approaches, that makes some readers maybe think that these books will be above them or over their heads a little bit. What are your thoughts about that? We've worried about that. We want to make this series accessible to uh, educated Latter-day Saints, but to non-scholars. And so we've driven home with our authors repeatedly. This is an opportunity for them to translate their great work for um, not for their academic peers, but for the folks in their wards, the folks in their neighborhoods who, uh, who they, they're going to be speaking directly to. We want it to be accessible. That can be hard for scholars to do. Are you taking any steps? I, I should also mention you're one of the editors overall. You and Phil Barlow were the main editors. Are you taking any steps with the authors to help them reach a broader audience? Yeah, so we've got several events planned. We've already done one where we bring authors into um, – kind of face-to-face -face with prospective readers where they present material and then get feedback. Uh, we did one on the BYU campus in July. We're going to do another one in mid-September, September 22 on BYU campus, another one in October, and then another, another one in the Boston area in, in late October as well, where our authors will have to kind of see if they're translating in a way that's meaningful to uh, to prospective readers. What excites you most about the series? You're the one who initially conceived of it. Yeah, I, one is the, the voices that we're gathering together to comment on the, the Book of Mormon's theological implications. These are scholars who are brilliant. They come with varied backgrounds academically, but they all have a kind of disciple soul as well. And they write at the intersection between that incredible training and that kind of warm heart uh, for that disciple's path. And so I'm excited to have these voices kind of come together to consider each individual book of the Book of Mormon. We've got one author per book. We're combining some of the short ones and splitting Alma. But otherwise, you get an individual author kind of wrestling with each book of the Book of Mormon. I, it's just exciting I, to see these minds grapple with this text we all love and that's meant so much to us. For those who are interested, uh, they can go to the Maxwell Institute's YouTube page and watch the first live event that we did uh, featuring Terrell Givens, Joe Spencer, and Mark Rathall talking about their volume. So you can go to our YouTube channel and watch that now. Also, mark your calendars. The next live event is going to be on September 22nd. Uh, watch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll announce exactly when that's going to happen, and, and a small audience will be able to get uh, to get in to see it in person, and those who can't will be able to watch it online. So that's September 22nd. Mark your calendar for Friday, October 18th, and then also Sunday, October 27th in Cambridge, Massachusetts. All of these will be live streamed. You'll be able to watch them during the event. You'll be able to watch them after the event. You'll get to know the authors of this series, brief theological introductions. Also, if you want to learn more about the series, right now you can see all the names of the authors and who's participating if you go to our website, mi.byu.edu slash brief. We don't have an official publication date yet for the first couple of volumes. The 12 volumes won't come out all at the same time. They're going to come out over the course of the year as the Gospel Doctrine lessons continue. But the first two volumes, uh, Joe Spencer in 1st Nephi and Terrell Givens for 2nd Nephi, we hope to see out in December in time for Christmas. That's the goal. We'll see if we make it. Spencer, thanks for telling us about the series. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you, Blair. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me, Blair Hodges, at mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you enjoy the podcast, please take a moment to rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. We're also available now on Spotify. 